Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2018 annual SPSP convention. Please welcome your 2018 convention chair from the University of Texas, Austin, Dr. Jenny Beer. Good morning. Welcome to Atlanta. I trust you all had great pre-conference yesterday. We had great attendance at those this year, and I hope that you enjoyed the opening reception last night at the aquarium. Over 3,800 people are gathered here this weekend, and hopefully you'll have many opportunities to network, connect, and share your best with the field. Pulling together a convention of this size year after year take the works of many volunteers, and I would like to take a moment to recognize them. Uh, that have worked a year round to make this weekend happen. In particular, I would like to give a special thanks to the convention committee members, Evan Affelbaum, Lisa Jeremka, Nick Rule, and Elliot Berkman. And thanks to the chairs of each programming strand, Chris Fraley, Carrie Kalkwami, they coordinated the symposia, Amy Somerville and Ken DeMarais handled the posters, data blitz, and paper sessions. Vipka Blydorn and Yoel Inbar managed the deep dive workshops. And Katie Corker, Cami Johnson, and Vivian Zayas oversaw the professional development planning. Please join me in thanking them for all their hard work. I encourage you to spend time reviewing the many sessions that are offered over the next two days. I would like to call your attention to two special uh, invited sessions that we have. The first is the importance of social psychological and personality research in the age of Trump, which is offered this afternoon at 2.15 p.m. Um, this could help if you find yourself bewildered by the daily news coming out of the U.S. <laughs> Uh, the second invited session is Registered Reports and Results Blind Reviews, Examples from Social Personality Psychology, which will be tomorrow at 2.15. There are several receptions throughout the weekend giving you the chance to network and socialize with your colleagues. All of these sessions and social hours, plus the pop-up programming created by attendees on site, can be viewed in the mobile app, which I encourage you to download if you haven't already. You can also rate every session you attend in the mobile app, and that feedback will help guide planning next year's convention in Portland. I sort of want to urge you to fill out those surveys. I combed them from last year to figure out what to do this year so that they really are used. Um, I know there are many of us who attend the convention every year, and there are also several hundred first-time attendees here this year. As you make your way through the convention, whether you're sort of a seasoned veteran or a newbie, I hope you enjoy the weekend, and I look forward to meeting many of you in the coming days. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage your 2018 SPSP president. From the University of Missouri, Dr. Lynn Cooper. Welcome. I'm really delighted to have all of you here. It's a great turnout. Thank you for showing up. Um, on behalf of the SPSP board directors, I am delighted to welcome you to Atlanta and our 2018 annual convention. This year's convention features the best of contemporary personality and social psychology in a program rich with opportunities to share your research and learn about the cutting edge work of others, to gain exposure to state-of-the-art research skills and methods, to collaborate with colleagues and students, and of course, to renew and affirm old friendships and make new ones all, hopefully, in a collegial, supportive, and fun environment. We hope your experience will be both rewarding and enriching. This year's outstanding program is a collaborative product of a large number of extremely talented and hardworking individuals whose uh, contributions Jenny just acknowledged. So please join me again in thanking the committee and the panels for all their hard work and for putting together such a fabulous program. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Jenny for her crucial role 
in bringing all of this together. It was a truly a Herculean effort, and the society is indebted to Jenny for her contribution. Again, our heartfelt thanks go out to you, Jenny. Thank you so much. Okay, so over the next few days, I really look forward to sharing this celebration of our science with all of you. Please feel free to stop me in the halls or email me uh, regarding any concerns or questions you have. There should be an email address or something up there. Um, uh, also, there's, um, yeah, okay. There's, there should be, but there isn't. So, I don't know, email me. So, <laughs> I hope you all enjoy the convention. Um, so now, I want to turn to the topic of today's plenary. Uh, which focuses on issues and impediments to building a cumulative, uh, broadly applicable science of psychology. In particular, this session focuses on the topic of generalizability, an issue that um, I would argue has been, strong, has been strangely neglected by our field despite its aspirations to build a science of human behavior. Um, a science of, if not universal truths, at least truths that are broadly applicable across large swaths of humanity. Yet our science is based almost entirely on samples that are decidedly not representative of all or even most of humanity. Concerns about the generalizability of our science are of course not new. In 1986, David Sears published a paper highlighting uh, social psychology's reliance on an overly narrow database. In an analysis of research published in JPSP, PSPB, and JESP in both 1980 and 1985, he found that 75% of published papers used North American college students as their subjects, a practice he noted that had developed and persisted since the early 1960s coincident with the rise of laboratory experimentation in social psychology. In 2010, some 25 years later, one of our panelists, Steve Heine, and his colleagues from the University of British Columbia reported an analysis of research published between the years 2003 and 2008 in several mainstream psychology journals, including JPSP, showing that roughly 70% of participants used in these studies came from the US and that more than 95% came from what they called weird countries, that is, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. Further, two-thirds of the American samples and 80% of the remaining samples were undergraduates. Sounds like, to me, not a lot changed in those 25 years from the time when Sears published that original analysis. So I was curious, the publications examined in Heine's paper are now 10 to 15 years old. Has anything changed since then? So to get a feel for this, I took a quick look at papers published in the 2016 volume of two of SPSP's journals, PSPB and SPPS, and found that actually the situation really hasn't changed much. 74% of these papers used North American samples, and 90% used what uh, uh, Steve and his colleagues called weird samples. However, there was one difference. The proportion using undergraduate students declined to about half, as opposed to the two-thirds or three-fourths reported in the earlier analyses. But this drop was accompanied by a corresponding increase in the use of MTurk samples, exactly. Indeed, together, more than 80% of all samples were comprised of either undergraduates or MTurk workers. Given that a number of recent studies raised serious concerns about just how typical MTurk workers are, one could certainly argue that issues with a narrow database persist more or less unabated. But maybe this is okay, if the composition of the world's population, if this mirrors the composition of the world's population. However, as you probably already know, the makeup of these samples is wildly out of line with the proportion of the world's population that the US and other weird countries account for. So 
Bottom line, for nearly 60 years now, since the early 1960s, psychology has been built on a very narrow and highly unrepresentative database. So the goal of today's session is to draw attention to this fact and to explore a number of issues and questions it raises. What are the risks of relying on such a narrow database? Can we build a generalizable science of human nature from such a narrow database? What are some barriers to increasing the diversity of samples and more important, what can be done to overcome these barriers in the short and the long term? And finally, are current efforts to address replicability concerns in our field synergistic with or inimical to efforts to enhance sample diversity? Um, so those are kind of the core questions I hope we'll address in the next hour. But if you would like to add your own questions to this conversation during the plenary, I encourage you to submit questions to the panelists by using the Convention mobile app. Um, by navigating to the plenary session, you can submit your questions throughout the session and then at the end of the presentations, um, I'll have access to those and we'll be able to uh, draw on those for the question and answer period. So now without uh, this, this is a brief background to uh, the topic that we're going to address today. I want to turn the podium over to our first speaker, Dr. Steve Heine, professor of psychology and distinguished university scholar at the University of British Columbia. So join me in welcoming Steve. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. And I'd just like to start by saying how happy I am that Lynn has made uh, this issue a, a priority for her presidency. I'm thrilled to be a part of it. This has been uh, an issue that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we call the, the weird problem. And what is this problem? Well, I think it has three related parts. That uh, one, we tend to assume universality in our research. Um, and two, we do this research based on a very narrow sample. And three, this narrow sample that we study is actually quite psychologically unusual. And I'm going to elaborate on these three points. Um, so first, uh, researchers often assume their findings are universal. And we rarely do this explicitly, saying that this finding would generalize anywhere. But we do it quite implicitly. One, we often will refer to things as a human bias. But two, it's very rare that we actually discuss our findings in terms of our samples, the nature of our samples. Often we don't even report um, much detail about the nature of our samples, and we don't discuss the conclusions uh, with regards to those samples, which is quite unusual in the, the social sciences. Um, the psychological database is narrow, so um, Jeffrey Arnett in, in 2008, uh, Lynn was mentioning this, had reviewed um, who the samples were in the six uh, top journals in psychology. 68% are from the US, 96% from the West, and uh, more than 70% came from undergrads. So when we talk about human nature, we're talking about those people in that picture there. That's really what our basis of our understanding is like. Um, another way of just pointing out how extreme this is, that the odds of a randomly chosen American undergrad showing up in a psychology study is more than 4,000 times greater than the odds of a randomly chosen uh, Westerner, non-Westerner, showing up in a study. So the degree of this non-representativeness is really quite staggering. It's an interesting question, well, why do we have this tendency here? I mean, one possibility that people suggest to me, maybe this is just a function of you know, the wealth and the strength of American universities. They can attract some of the best researchers around the world, and maybe those researchers are just studying the convenient people around them. I don't think that's a good account for this, though. So, um, back in 1997, there was a review of uh, 20 different science disciplines to see where do citations come from. And in psychology, 70% of them come from the US. Um, and that was the highest among these 20 sciences. And in contrast, for chemistry, it's only 37% of citations come from the US. And it's worth noting that it doesn't really matter where you do a chemistry experiment. Your results should look the same. But for psychology studies, often it does matter where you do your study and, and who your sample uh, is. And after the US, the next biggest producers of citations in psychology in order are the UK, Canada, and Australia. 
So curiously, psychology is largely done by English-speaking people, and this is something that I don't think anyone has really uh, um, addressed before or figured out why that is. So we call our current database weird, Western educated, industrialized, rich democratic societies. And um, uh, my colleagues, Joe Henrik, R. and Oren Zion, and I, we reviewed the um, psychological and behavioral science literature to find any instance of a psychological phenomenon that has been studied in, in several countries to compare the results. And I'm going to share very quickly uh, what those results look like in a series of four telescoping uh, comparisons. So our first comparison uh, is industrialized versus non-industrialized societies. How do they compare? Where, where are they different? Well, uh, first some visual illusions. So industrialized societies show a more pronounced muller liar illusion than do non-industrialized societies. Uh, motivations for fairness as, as assessed using economic games like dictator game are, are more pronounced in industrialized societies. Um, a different kind of folk biological reasoning in industrialized societies, people tend to project human qualities onto other species that doesn't happen in other societies. In industrialized societies, we tend to experience space and encode and remember it from an egocentric uh, perspective, how it appears to me, whereas in uh, the rest of the world, they, use, uh, they rely more on the cardinal uh, directions to represent space. Uh, the next contrast here is Western versus non-Western societies. And so these are some domains in which the Western societies are in an extreme position. Western societies show more analytic reasoning instead of holistic reasoning, uh, more independent self-concepts, which is quite important given how central a self-concept is to how we experience uh, the world around us, more motivations for self-enhancement, uh, less conforming, uh, more desire for choice, uh, a morality that's uh, almost exclusively based on justice concerns, harm and fairness rather than other moral foundations, and uh, showing less anti-social punishment. That is a tendency to punish people who cooperate out of revenge or, or, or spite. Um, next comparison was comparing how Americans look uh, uh, in contrast to other Westerners. And so Americans occupy a more extreme position first for more defensive reactions to thoughts of death, that is larger effect sizes and terror management studies. Uh, even more independent selves than Westerners, even more analytic reasoning than Westerners, and even more desire for choice. And our last contrast was between college-educated Americans uh, versus other Americans. And college-educated Americans uh, are more extreme for uh, showing higher heritability estimates for IQ, meaning when you're trying to calculate how much of I the variability of IQ is due to the genome, you calculate a higher percentage when you're studying high SES Americans than you do low SES Americans. And there's yet even more desire for choice among this group than other Americans, even more analytic thinking, even more independent views of self, less conforming, uh, more justice-based morality, and, and more defensive responses to death thoughts. So we're talking about an outlier among outliers, and this is the sample that we're generalizing from, from the tail end of a distribution. So has there been any progress in the past decade? Well, I think some signs of uh, progress we can see from editors such as uh, Lynn Cooper and Shinobu Kitayama at JPSB in their editorials have both explicitly called for this to be a, a, an issue, to have broader samples. And uh, Lynn Cooper has created um, an SPSP globalization task force uh, uh, to, to address this. On the other hand, um, uh, signs of stagnation, Lynn was pointing out with the SPSP journals, the publication trends have largely remained uh, the same. There's just a couple other data points on this. this is from a paper from Nathan Cheek, this is what APS journals look like in terms of the percent of American authors. If you look at, say, 2008, when Jeffrey Arnett reviewed the, the, the literature, uh, to now, and especially if you look at the bottom line is Psych Science, the empirical journal, there hasn't been a decrease in American authors over this time. There's another analysis came out last year looking what the situation is in developmental journals, and the vast majority of the samples in developmental journals are weird, and that hasn't changed over time either. At least it's not a problem just for social personality psychology, but this isn't a, prob a problem that uh, many fields here share. So I'd like to talk briefly about some implications of these weird research practices. 
One, I think studying weird samples limits the topics of research. It narrows the scope of our imagination because we're only able to reliably think about things that are concerned, psychological processes that we notice among weird samples. And so there's many topics that, that we don't encounter things like this antisocial punishment, or concerns with face, or, or karma, or honor, uh, or holistic reasoning. These are uh, ideas, important psychological phenomena that we're less likely to even consider. I think studying weird sa samples also has a consequence of marginalizing international researchers. If the bulk of citations are coming out of the US and other English-speaking countries, and people want to contribute to this cumulative science, but they're studying samples that these same effects might not uh, be realized, it's much harder to participate in this conversation, to have relevant research. And I think this has marginalized international researchers uh, over time. Um, if you look at uh, interventions that are you know, based on the basic science that comes out studying weird people, well, those interventions probably aren't going to work so well elsewhere to the extent that, that the basic science, that the findings underlying those in interventions uh, won't replicate in other contexts. We wouldn't expect the interventions to work well either. Um, and our narrow samples makes our research less relevant for, for policymakers. Policymakers, they want to do policies that affect uh, all of society or some particular marginalized groups when we can only tell them things about MTurk workers and universities, American university students, we can't really contribute as much to that dialogue. And I think the replicability crisis makes this worse, which Lucas is going to talk more about this, but I think an unintended consequence of trying to address this crisis by having bigger sample sizes and more replications is that we've incentivized convenient samples even more. Um, so where do we go from here? I think most researchers would find cross-cultural data on their pet phenomena to be informative. They, they, would, they would find this interesting and informative to their theories, but we don't collect much of this data, and I think that's a problem with the incentives that we have. So I'm going to just very briefly throw out a, a, a list of some ideas of things we might be able to do to incentivize researchers to gather more of this data. Um, one, this is something that uh, Yuichi is going to talk more about, but I think we should be explicit about uh, specifying who are we generalizing to from, from our studies. Um, and uh, in, in, in doing that, I think that raises the question in other people's minds of what remains to be done here. Um, we should have developed norms to have more detailed reporting of, of our samples, which would greatly facilitate meta-analyses. A few years back, Sam Gosling had an idea that there should be an annual prize for a paper that makes the biggest contribution to the field, a theoretical or a methodological contribution, by way of an underrepresented sample. I think that's a great idea that we should follow up on. Um, badges have worked well in the replicability crisis. Maybe we can use those for increasing the use of underrepresented samples. Uh, we can help foster collaborative networks of researchers who can work on a similar project from, uh, from multiple sites. We can encourage study swaps. I'll collect data for you, you collect data for me. And I think we should consider some diversity targets. We can monitor our performance. Are we getting better? Are we getting closer to the, the, the kinds of samples uh, that we think the field should have? Okay. So and just thanks to my co-authors, uh, Joe Henrik and Aaron Orenzine. Thank you. Okay, next I'd like to invite um, Dr. Veronica Benet Martinez, ICREA Research Professor at, and I forgot to ask you how to pronounce the name of your university. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Dr. Um, Martinez to the stage. Thanks. Good morning. Thank you, Lynn, for having us this morning. Uh, I'm at Pompeu Fabra University, it's a university in Barcelona. And I'm here today to talk about some things that I think Steve has already covered, but to go beyond that and tell you a little bit about what I think research with underrepresented samples looks like and how to go about doing that. And uh, some really interesting and exciting theoretical developments that I hopefully will, you know, whet your interest about doing this kind of research. 
Our mission statement uh, says very clearly that one of our goals as a society is to understand individuals in the social context for the benefits of all people. As Lynn says, this doesn't have to be every single human being on planet Earth, but we should try to cover as much cultures and groups as, as possible. And um, this means that, of course, doing research with uh, socioculturally and re underrepresented samples is very, very important. It's critical for our field. And uh, one of the you know, sad consequences of not doing that and focusing only on weird samples is that our work is scientifically less valid, but it's also less fair. It's, uh, it's from a social justice perspective, it's basically a work that fewer people can relate to or care about or find useful. And that, given that you know, many people pay taxes <laughs> for the and, and contribute to the research we do, I think that we need to care about those issues also very much. Uh, therefore, the title of my talk is how we can do research that is more social, culturally inclusive, that will also be more fair and relatable. Um, how do we go about doing that? Steve mentioned different ways we can incentivize this kind of research. And I wanted to just say a quick note to reviewers and editors who don't seem to understand this very well in principle. And I think some of you might be here, uh, you've done work with those underrepresented groups and you get this response from reviewers and editors where they tell you good work, interesting design, interesting results. But I think you should publish this in the Journal of Cross-Cultural Psychology of cultural diversity and ethnic minority. Uh, and then you're like, well, why? Um, we don't have a journal for European American studies. Why, you know, why don't we tell everyone doing samples, you know, work with weird samples, published in the Journal of European American Studies? The reason we don't have a journal for European American Studies is that all journals are for European American Studies, are American journals. So th think about that. Um, and then I think that most of you know that generaliz generalizability and replicability are different things, and I know that the next two presenters will be talking about this. But I think that this, our current emphasis on replicability, which is very important, if, if, if anything, and Steve mentioned this, has discouraged cross-cultural research because some researchers new to cross-cultural research think, well, if I don't get the same findings in another cultural group, will that be interpreted as your study, your findings don't replicate? So we need to keep this in mind. And uh, in the next part of my presentation, I just wanted to remind you what social cultural diversity looks like and how to study it. Uh, this very well-known paper published by Adam Cohen a few years ago reminds us that besides ethnicity and race, which many of you are you know, acquainted with and you, and you know what cross-cultural research and research with ethnic minorities looks like, we should also think of other forms of culture like religion. On the right side of my presentation, I'll have a few examples. I could, of course, present so many different examples of researchers that have done a great job in examining, for instance, how religion really, really matters in predicting values and identity, differences between Protestants and Catholics. Also, we should also study people with that religion, atheists and agnostics. It also makes a difference in how they see the world and their values. Uh, different religious groups deal with uh, you know, with taboos and forbidden feelings different way, which leads Protestants apparently are very good at sublimating those feelings, which leads to creativity. There's all kinds of interesting relationships between some of the countries we study and religion. religion. The same can be said for socioeconomic status. We've made better advancements in studying socioeconomic status, but, uh, oops, I have to go back. Um, basically, we tend to focus on middle upper class samples when in fact working class samples look very much like some of the samples that you see in other so-called collectivist cultures where issues, you know, the emphasis on choice and agency is just not as prevalent with those samples, so we should be mindful about this. I could go on, we also have religion, we have to be mindful of the, basically the ecology and the region where those samples are placed. One thing is to study people in Northern, North America, uh, in the northern parts of states, in the southern states, cultures of honor, the ecology of those groups, and I understand, you know, this leads to all kinds of interesting hypotheses about how certain personalities are more prevalent in certain states of the United States and how this relates to very important social indicators that many of you care about, like political orientation, uh, degree of innovation in these communities, etc. 
Again, I could go on, and there are so many other types of diversity that we really should care about and be sensitive in our designs, like gender and sexuality, but we should also pay a lot of attention to issues about intersectionality. For some groups, the intersection of race and gender and social class and maybe even culture leads to some really interesting emerging properties that we should care about. And we should also learn the methodology to deal with intersectionality, not just create an interaction term that doesn't really take care of what that phenomenon looks for that group, although that's one way to do it. Uh, now that I've told you a little bit, many of you are familiar with those constructs, but you're like, how do we go about doing this? I wanted to excite you about some, what I think are some interesting theoretical shifts in the study of cultural diversity that you might not be aware. Some of you already know this, but the field seems to be moving away. I mean, the, this very interesting set of research that we've been doing over the last 20, 25 years, comparing samples in Southeast Asia and the United States, it really is responsible for the birth and the flourishing of, of cross-cultural research. But more and more studies are starting to look at other regions of the world, and this is extremely important. We still have so little research in Africa and South America. Uh, there are so many different variants of individualism and collectivism come to Southern Europe where collectivism and individualistic in very interesting ways. And I'll get to that actually in a second. Uh, also, we're moving away from concept conceptualizations of culture as a hardwired trait, as something that is the property of, is a stable trait, is domain general, is like a worldview that we take with us everywhere. And we seem to be moving away from this con type of conceptualization to a conceptualization, and there's some really interesting papers about this, uh, as something more dynamic as uh, a sort of domain-specific set of schemas, as a tool set that you have with different tools that you apply in different situations, and also culture as something between individuals. Culture gets enacted when two individuals from, from, from one culture get together, and they both know what the norm for that situation is, and only till that moment when they interact, the cultural script comes up. They, don't, they didn't have it necessarily already. Um, and I wanted to elaborate on this with the next slide, which is uh, basically relates to a wonderful paper by Michael Morris and colleagues that basically puts this in a picture for you. We're moving away from a conceptualization of culture or culturalism where culture is like the hardware, right? So I am from Spain, and let's say that I'm more of a uh, you know, app, uh, Windows person, and I meet a person from another cult culture that has a different type of hardware, a different operating system. Uh, and every, every individual is, we basically not explicitly, but implicitly we assume that individuals from culture A have a, all a sort of semi-identical representation or, you know, set of cultural schemas as the next person from that culture. When in fact, culture looks more like what you see on the right. Culture is like a set of apps that you download and you use in different situations. So some of you here from America, you have downloaded a lot of apps that relate to co you know, competencies and schemas in the United States, but you probably have downloaded some apps also from other cultures that you've interacted with intensely, from uh, et cetera. And um, this is basically how we need to think about culture, more like applications. And uh, you know, many peop some people have a lot of apps in their, in their operating system. We we'll listen to my next point, which is we also seem to be moving away from an emphasis on cultural differences, which are also very important, that we continue studying, to an emphasis on how individuals manage multiple cultures within themselves, due to globalization, migration trends, the speed of travel and communication. Many individuals actually, as the picture before, show are really competent and attached to and involved with different cultures, and there's lots of research. This is some of the research that uh, people here have carried, and I've collaborated with some of those individuals. Um, also wanted to, t I've, I've observed a trend towards studies that include more than two cultures. So till basically a few years ago, many, many cross-cultural studies of cultures and cultural diversity carefully, very carefully in theory driven, chose two cultures to examine. Now, because we have wonderful tools like big data, uh, you know, the ability to collaborate very easily with people from other cultures uh, and, and nations and universities, we collect larger amounts of data, larger amounts of countries. We have multi-level modeling. We can do triangulation where we choose three cultures that differ on two dimensions in different ways. You know, for instance, Japan is collectivist. Uh, Spain is collectivist in a different way, like between the United States, so I stood Japan, Spain, United States, etc. And this is really, really wonderful. It's also led to lots of interesting exploratory research, but a word of caution. I think that we should still 
very, pay a lot of attention and put a lot of emphasis into one culture studies where we do a lot of intensive study of one culture to understand that within cultural dynamics that would in fact help us understand uh, other between culture uh, research that we might do. So I just wanted to you know, put a word of caution about that. And I'll just finish, I have two slides left, by telling you that there are wonderful resources to do cross-cultural research, SPSP is one. Uh, we don't have a lot of cultural, cross-cultural diversity in the association, but that's changing slowly. I have some uh, names of associations here that you might want to check out. Hey, if you want to do research with Spanish population, I can hook you up with CEPs, this, you know, Sociedad Científica Española for the, La Psicología Social, and they, they are very interested in this kind of work. And I wanted to finish my presentation uh, telling you about the International Association of Cross-Cultural Psychology, which many people don't know is not a, an association of cross-cultural psychologists per se. Many of them are social personality psychologists who are interested in understanding cultural issues, and they come to those conferences. Uh, it you know, has many, many, many researchers from all over the world. Look at that, what I put up there. 40% of them are social personality psychologists. And I wanted to let, tell you that the Journal of Cross-Cultural Psychology also publishes studies that deal with cultural diversity within the United States uh, that em emphasize issues around ethnicity, doesn't have to be cult cross-cultural comparison, and please check out the journal. And I'll finish my presentation by just saying, uh, yes, you can do it, and do it in your own way. Thank you very much. All right. Next, I'd like to invite Yuichi Shoda, professor of psychology from the University of Washington, to uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am delighted that we, we're having this session this, this, this morning on this very important topic, and I'm also i um, uh, delighted to be a part of um, this group, to be able to share some ideas um, I have with you. Um, so, in the spirit of learning from the past, when psychology um, grappled with the issue on the question of generalizability, um, I'd like to start with uh, Lee Kronbach's APA presidential address in which he pointed out that findings of experiments in one group of people do not necessarily apply to other groups of people. Um, he made this remark quite a long time ago, uh, but at that time he recognized that there was a crisis of generalizability. His proposed solution was that we should explicitly study person by situation interaction. By that what he meant was that when we do an experiment, instead of jumping to a conclusion that people do this behavior more in condition, in one condition over another condition, let's explicitly study how the effect of the experiment depends on the, uh, the people's characteristics, such as their aptitude. So many studies of um, person by situation interactions um, have been done. Um, during the two decades following his um, uh, presidential address. But in um, 1975, when he gave a Distinguished Scientist Award, he was rather pessimistic, um, and he said, once we attend on, uh, to interactions, we enter a hall of mirrors that extends to infinity. And what he meant by that is that, yes, we can study uh, patterns of interaction and how an experiment, uh, experiment's results um, depend on personal characteristics, but that in turn, that interaction pattern in turn depends on another factor, and the three-way interaction uh, in turn may depend on another factor, so that we have four-way, five-way interactions, and those high order, higher order interactions are um, very difficult to understand, and they require a very large number of uh, sample size to uh, study with sufficient power. Um, so I, I feel that um, uh, his pessimism, pessimism can be, uh, is understandable. And on top of this, any one factor may have many more than two levels. So for example, um, a finding of interaction that you make uh, using uh, among American college students may not apply among American farm workers. 
and uh, that may be different from uh, what you find among Iranian uh, professionals or Ethiopian clergymen or Ethiopian clergywomen, um, and so on. And I hope you can see that this is a daunting proposition to study general generalizability in this way. Um, so today I'd like to share with you uh, what might be a helpful alternative approach to address the question of generalizability. And this is based on an idea that Dan Simons and Steve Lindsay and myself um, wrote about um, last year. And uh, this is essentially encouraging um, papers, empirical papers to have a section uh, that we called Constraints on Gener Generality. And it's a section in which we hope authors would um, state and describe the target population that they would like or they, would, they think their findings would generalize to. Um, so um, this approach is based on a number of uh, basic principles. And one of them is this belief that studies of a specific population can be highly valuable. Uh, this echoes what Veronica said about studying one culture um, uh, as well. And uh, one example that I often think about is the study of uh, this rare group of HIV-positive individuals who maintain undetectable viral loads in the absence of any treatment. Studying this group of people can lead to um, findings that can benefit many, many uh, people, even though the study uh, uh, is uh, looking at this very small and rare population of people. Uh, but this has to be combined with the, our faith in our scientific community that after we study one population of people, we don't stop there. That we study more um, populations and see if the same phenomenon will occur, if there are uh, different uh, um, uh, uh, findings in different, across different populations. So we should study four and more, we should keep on going. And um, the, the hope is that um, by doing this, um, we can address the question of generalizability, not by individual studies, but by the totality of accumulated evidence. And we do so not by doing analysis of variance, um, as you saw that there are lots of missing cells in that gigantic uh, cube, uh, but rather we approach it more theoretically. Um, in other words, we want to develop more comprehensive theories that um, acknowledge, embrace, and account for the diversity of findings across different populations. But for this to work, um, it's very important that each study not uh, be considered uh, as a study of general truth or people in general. Uh, and it's very important that each study should uh, uh, state the intended target population, hence the uh, constraint on general, generalities statement. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what uh, the benefit that we might um, gain by doing so. Uh, one of them is that um, Speci being specific about the, the target population uh, can highlight the need for studying many different populations. So as an illustration, imagine you read a sentence in a, an abstract of a paper, participants did more of this behavior when such and such happened. We encounter this kind of statements all the time, but in contrast, imagine um, it was written this way. Introductory psychology students at the University of Washington did more of this behavior when this happened. Now, if you're like me, when you read the second version, you may be immediately thinking, well, sure, that may be the case, but what about other populations, right? And what, what about other countries? Um, in other words, being very specific about the target population can highlight the need to, uh, for studying many different populations. Um, and doing so uh, will provide the information necessary to examine generality and uh, then identify boundary conditions. And I hope that that would also lead to promoting discovering boundary conditions as a key for scientific progress. 
And this might even change publishing incentives in favor of a more cumulative science. So imagine you submitted a paper to a journal and the editor said, well, I'm not sure if we want to publish this paper because there, uh, don't we know this already? There are many other studies that have found this kind of result. Uh, but you might be able to say, um, well, look, um, look at the, read the COG statements, COG constraints on generality statements of those other papers that are already published. And it's clear based on them that um, this finding, um, we don't know whether this finding um, uh, would occur in this particular population that I studied in my study. Therefore, um, our study will make a unique contribution to, uh, to cumulative science. Um, so just very briefly, um, this approach is different from Kronbach's recommendation uh, in the sense that um, it recognizes that each study is necessarily limited in scope uh, and generality is addressed by the totality of accumulating evidence. I wondered how other sciences address this question. So um, I looked at some journals and uh, I looked at geology. Uh, according to Wikipedia, this is a journal that is most widely read scientific uh, journal. And um, here is a table of content from uh, uh, one uh, month. And um, as you can see that, um, or maybe it's too small, but um, the, the first paper, uh, the title of the first paper is not uh, about the rocks in general or even certain kinds of rocks, uh, but it specifies uh, as uh, the early, late uh, uh, Devonian paleo-equatorial zone in Svalbard. Uh, um, other papers, have uh, specified their target population uh, as, 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 um, as narrowly as this. Yet these papers are published in their most uh, cited or most widely read journal. Um, I also looked at jo uh, Journal of Organic Chemistry, which according to Wikipedia is uh, the most cited in the field of organic chemistry. And um, here is a table of content. And the first paper is a reaction between, I don't think I'm going to try to pronounce this, um, <laughs> Uh, this particular compound and this other particular compound, uh, very specific to those. those. It's, not, it's not even about like, these kinds of compounds in general, but it's those, very specific to those two. And that also is the case for the uh, other papers published in that uh, journal as well. Um, so I think that we may be able to address generalizability in, in similar ways. Um, if we work together as a scientific community, and uh, if we don't expect that studies from a single lab speak to people in general. Um, in other words, um, I think it requires that we trade our desire to, to do studies that would instantly produce generalizable result, uh, and, and think of our work as contributing a piece to the accumulating body of knowledge that in turn can be used to uh, understand generalizability and specificity and develop more uh, comprehensive theories. Thank you very much. Okay, and finally, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Rich Lucas, Foundation Professor of Psychology at Michigan State University, who's going to talk uh, about maybe a fly in the ointment here and how concerns about replicability and concerns about generalizability might relate to one another. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I think my role here is to talk about the replication crisis and the way that we struggled with that and whether that has any implications for this attempt to uh, be more, have more studies that are more generalizable. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is kind of quickly go through a few points just about how, uh, some of the concerns that people have raised about this, and these are meant mainly to kind of spur some discussion, which we'll have some time for at the end, and then really focus my talk on uh, some solutions that I think that we can focus on that have come out of some of our efforts to deal with these issues. Um, so I think when we think about the replicability crisis, we all know what this is. I'm going to quickly go through this. So uh, we know that concerns about the replicability of our results have led to uh, calls for increased power, and many of the ways that we would try to do that is through larger sample sizes. Uh, we have suggested that maybe we need more replications to make sure that the results we have are robust. And also, perhaps, uh, we can even have higher standards of evidence, so there have been some calls for lower p-values, these sorts of things, uh, which then lead to some concerns about the type of studies that are going to be result. Uh, that are going to result. 
So I think that one of the reactions is that the, one of the concerns that's come, that's come up is that these more stringent standards will then lead to greater difficulty publishing research with diverse samples, and so that this might make the field even more reliant on the weird samples that we've been uh, talking about. And also a broader concern is that it's just gonna make our fields uh, a little bit more reliant on easy methods, things that are not really gonna tell us deep knowledge about uh, the phenomena that we're interested in. Um, and so the first response that I wanted to, to say to this is that our statistics don't depend on who the sample is. So if the concerns about reliability, or replicability of our findings are legitimate, and so we can have these discussions, but if you believe the concerns about uh, replicability, then these concerns apply in the same way regardless of what samples we're using, what populations we're looking at. So if our underpowered studies and our weak standards of evidence uh, and the lack of uh, replication and focus on replications uh, do lead to problematic results, then this is gonna be true regardless of the sample and the population that we're using. These, the problems are still there. Uh, and one of the issues that we have to consider is that not that this uh, makes it more difficult to do research with diverse samples, but actually, we might actually be more concerned about these issues when the participants that we're trying to recruit are more difficult to get into our studies, where their time is more valuable precisely because uh, we haven't been able to incorporate them into our studies in the past. So just as a quick reminder of the issues that people have been discussing about these problems, uh, if you do an underpowered study, if you do a, a study with 50% power, and you are studying a true effect, it is basically a coin flip as to whether you get a significant result that you can publish if we are using public uh, statistical significance as a filter for publication. So the result there is all those st uh, participants that you worked so hard to recruit, uh, all their time was just wasted because you had such a low probability of finding this effect that was actually real in your study. You may even find an effect that is in the opposite direction to the true effect uh, in your sample, which is a, uh, the result of that is wasted time and the wrong answer that sends us down the wrong direction in the future when we try to follow this up with uh, additional research. Now we also know that this problem is then exacerbated by researcher degrees of freedom, which people are also focusing on as well. The response that people usually raise to this question is, well, isn't some information better than nothing? Shouldn't we get these small samples and see what we find in those small samples and put that out there and then over time we'll learn what actually is the truth? I think that that's true in a perfect world, but the fact is we're not living in a perfect world where we have, and in our world, at least right now, we have flexible and data analyses and large file drawers, and this sort of thing, uh, combined with these small samples, really distorts the picture that we're getting from the literature. So I think some information in these cases, in the world that we're living in, isn't better than no information. It can often be worse because it leads us in the wrong direction. So, what are some potential solutions that we can use? One of these, again, is to embrace a lot of the things that I think have been coming up, uh, coming out of these discussions about concerns about replicability. So open practices are especially important when these samples are hard to reach, hard to recruit. So if we were able to create a world where the information that these studies provides are out there and valuable regardless of the outcome, where there isn't pressure uh, to get a significant result with our underpowered studies, where we could re, uh, where there would be pre-registered studies or, or in especially registered reports where this difficult study that we are going to do that's gonna be very expensive to get the population, the sample that we want, uh, if that was guaranteed to be published regardless of the result, then I'm more confident that some information is better than, uh, than nothing from those. And so if we adopt those practices, then I think that uh, then this intuition we have about uh, these samples, uh, I think, will be more realistic. It also makes it more useful to, data, to share the data that we get from these uh, difficult to, uh, to reach samples. Uh, and the more we do that, the more we encourage us, the more people benefit from the data that we have. Other solutions? <clears throat> um, have to do with collaboration. And so far we've talked about collaboration in kind of vague terms, but actually there are a lot of very specific, very concrete efforts for, de for fostering collaboration. Some of the ones that I put up here on the screen right now uh, so, for instance, uh, very uh, hard. I don't do infants. Uh, do research with infants? I think it would be hard to do. Uh, Michael Frank, with the Many Babies Project, has tried to get labs together to have larger samples of infants in these developmental studies, and for this very reason, they're difficult to, studies to do, hard samples to reach. Let's combine efforts and do this. Let's actually work right now to get these people together to do this. 
uh, Psychological Science Accelerator is a project that is getting labs together to decide what is a study that's worth doing. It's an important enough study that we can get groups of researchers together to agree to pool their efforts to do these types of studies, sometimes with difficult to reach samples. These sorts of things happen. Study Swap is a place where you can post your uh, demands for a study, what we, sorts of studies we need to do. Let's get together. Let's see what samples I have availability of, what sorts of methods I can do. Let's see what other people need. Let's see if we can put people together to actually get these studies done. These are already happening right now. You can go to these websites. You can get participate in these studies. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, that Jimichi has a session today on the Study Swap Live where you can actually come together and talk about your needs and see whether there are other people that can help you out with that. There's a session today. There's a session tomorrow. Look at those in your programs. You can do these. One of the things that I wanted to point out about all of these efforts here is that all of them are started by people who are actually very, very seriously concerned about replicability and replicability issues. So is a concern about replicability inimical to uh, getting diverse samples? I think the most concrete solutions we have right now, the actual things that are happening right now to deal with both replicability and diversity uh, are these types of things. And so I think that that shows that they are not inimical. Finally, uh, the one thing I wanted to, to point out is that we should also expand our ideas about appropriate research methods. So I think that uh, Lynn's comment about uh, <coughs> the Sears study and that um, when uh, these sorts of samples started to become a problem, I think it is uh, uh, maybe traced to a very narrow view of what a, an appropriate research method is. And so I have students that have gone on the job market, so I do research on uh, w where we often use uh, very large representative samples, followed for many, many years. Um, my students do research on those sorts of things. They do really interesting questions, I think. So for one student did uh, research on uh, immigrants to Germany who were followed for many, many years. Uh, other students still look at uh, income inequality and its relation to well-being, these sorts of things. And one of the things that they often, feedback they often get, or I get about them when they go on the job market, is that, uh, yeah, their studies were great, they're publishing in good journals, but how are they going to train our students to do experiments? And uh, if we are going to insist on doing the types of uh, work where we collect all our own data, we design every little thing, uh, rather than going to all the data that's out there, uh, huge samples from many different countries that other social sciences are using to answer questions like the ones that we are trying to answer, that we, if we have to be able to use some of the methods, adopt some of the methods that those other sciences are using, and if we broaden our scope about uh, broaden our ideas about what an appropriate research method is, it actually allows us to maybe uh, incorporate some of those existing data sets uh, that will allow us to do this. So I think we have some concrete solutions. We need to think about the ways that we can foster collaboration. Uh, so I encourage you to participate in those things that are existing. I also encourage you to broaden the types of things that we think are appropriate research methods, um, and that might actually enable us to kind of solve some of the problems that we have. mic on? You can hear? Okay, great. Well, you guys did a fabulous job of finishing with uh, some time for questions. So uh, for those of you who don't have the app or haven't looked at the app, I do have lots of questions here that the audience has submitted and you can actually vote on questions that you would especially like to see asked. So I'm going to start now with the question that's at the top of the list. The most people have said they'd be interested um, in this question. So let me, uh, let me start. So, um, and it's building off of what Rich just talked about, so I think it's a nice transition. Several of the presenters recommend collaboration as a way to address some of these issues. But how will my work be evaluated if all of my papers are multi-authored, especially if I'm not the first author, which is not a reasonable expectation to always be the first author if you're working with many collaborators? Uh, how will I establish myself as an independent scholar? So thoughts on this? I don't know who might like to start? Steve? Um, just the one thing I would add to this is I don't think we're suggesting that the only kind of research you should do is big collaborative research on uh, dealing with diverse samples. Um, as someone you know who, who's one of the authors on this Weird People paper, most of my research I still do with, with convenient samples, but I mean I do look always to extend that uh, and 
extend the generalizability of it that if you just think of how many different studies go into a JPSP paper, not every single study is to explain everything and explain all concerns. And I th think the same thing too. Not every paper is going to be one that's going to be um, uh, including n diverse samples or, or address um, uh, drawing boundaries across conditions. We should always talk about it, it should be on the forefront. But I think in addition to these collaborative networks and the, these, these big multi-author papers, I think we can still, I don't think we're saying stop doing everything that you're doing right now, but in addition to what you're doing right now, to have these concerns in mind. Yeah. Um, I, I totally agree with Steve, uh, but I was also saying that um, uh, we should think about the long-term uh, cultural change. Um, and so, um, if um, people who serve on promotion committees um, can have this, uh, keep this in the back of their mind so that every time there's an opportunity to make a small uh, incremental difference to, to recognize many different kinds of contribution to science, um, because it used to be that there was a fairly narrow uh, way in which uh, psychological scientists contributed to, to our, our body of knowledge, but now there are many, and I think the collaborative, large-scale collaboration is, is one of them, and I think that we need to change um, how we approach uh, promotion um, uh, in such a way that we recognize those uh, broad, newly uh, expanding ways of uh, contributing to, to science. Now it disappeared again. Lynn, can I add a few Please. Something? So I think that the incentive system is really key to this. So in the same way that no one questions today that um, good researchers use multiple methods and, oh man, if they use cross, you know, experiments and correlational studies, they, that's wonderful. We should also think that researchers should use different forms of collaboration. So some papers can be, you know, single author papers or two authors. Other papers really demonstrate that ability to develop a network of collaborators in other countries. Uh, so a combination of this two. But when you do the second, another thing that I think is really positive is that you involve your grad students and the, your international collaborators also involve their grad students. So there's also a lot of exchange among the grad students that can visit each other's labs. And I think that uh, to me, that's really how we should be doing this. Mm -hmm. So it's not only collaborating from the distance, but also going to those places, bringing the PhD students to where you are, sending your own students, and uh, um, I think the field really should be thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a common theme to these answers is that, in, in one sense, what we need to be thinking about, at least in part here, is broadening the definition of what we consider to be good scholarship. You know, and that we've been rather um, focused on one method as being the uh, sort of the epitome of good science, and and it's maybe the case that in fact all methods have limitations and weaknesses, and that you know heterogeneity in methods is what will ultimately best serve uh, all of our scientific goals. Uh, let me move on to a next question, which is I will point out. By, a, by quite a large margin, the most popular question here, which I think means many of you will resonate to it. I am a graduate student or a substitute, you know, early career person or a postdoc, whatever. I don't have the time or the resources to do this kind of work. I need to finish school and get a job. What do you recommend I do? <laughs> <laughs> Pragmatism. <laughs> I think part of it is our, is our job too. I mean, the, the people that are kind of safe and established, I think that if, our, if, if what we're doing is thinking about these issues now and providing opportunities for our graduate students to do these things as well, I think that that can help us uh, get there. So I think that, you know, kind of it's all of our jobs to kind of think about how we can do this and uh, make sure that, again, whether it's uh, the collaborative efforts that do in allow anybody to get involved. So I think that we see a lot of uh, some of these collaborative, uh, large, uh, multiple lab groups. So it's an opportunity for graduate students to get involved. Um, so I think that that's been done with replications, but I think that also in terms of kind of diversifying our samples, people getting involved in those sorts of things as well. So I think that um, providing those, uh, if all of us can help provide those opportunities, then maybe we can make it easier and uh, for those people who don't have the ability to go do it themselves to uh, accomplish research in this way. I just wanted to say something that Rich mentioned earlier, which was wonderful, which is you don't have to collect new data. The data's there already. There's so many huge data sets, panel studies in Germany, the Netherlands, Spain. Europeans have a tendency to collect a lot of this kind of data for some reason. European Social Survey, the World Value Survey. So uh, 
to the answer, like to the question, I don't have the time. It's like the data is already there. So you don't have to collect the data. And I think, yeah, and I think that sometimes in the, the issue that I was raising is that I think sometimes we have a sense that, yeah, the data is out there, somebody else collected it, it's not going to have anything of interest in mind. But actually, I think if we think differently about how we use those data, sometimes really basic, really important questions that all of us in this room would be interested in, you can find in, in, uh, interesting ways to test them. And you can do that while you're running your experiments, you know, while you're running your own subjects in your lab uh, with the samples that you have access to. You can also be going to these other data sources and thinking very differently about how you're answering that question. And again, the breadth of the uh, approaches you're taking to the same question, I think, strengthen the answers to the questions that we get. So I think always keeping an eye open for um, the various ways, collaborations, existing data, while collecting your own data, all of these things, if you can try to, um, some of them aren't expensive to do, and so if you can do them, watch out for those opportunities as much as possible, I think you can get a lot done. Yeah. Um, okay, another question. <clears throat> um, second most popular question. Many of the proposed solutions rely on individual researchers making changes in the work they do. Are there any ideas for initiatives that target journal editors, tenure and promotion committees, or funders to make sure that the trade-offs that may be required to do this work well are appropriately considered? So, may I start? Yes, so, please. Uh, I guess the constraint on general, generality statement, I think it's one of the uh, things that uh, journals can adopt. Um, and I think in addition, um, a, a broader issue is really trying to encourage people to um, uh, specify, that, well, I guess I am saying the same thing, <laughs> specific target uh, population they would like to generalize to, and uh, um, that would be make, make a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would just mention that, <clears throat> I, I mentioned earlier that I had just done this sort of quick and dirty analysis of two publications 2016 and two of SPSB's journals, and uh, some of the things I found, but I think the thing that actually was the most shocking to me was that only 24% of the published papers reported any demographic breakdown on their samples beyond gender and mean age. And many of them didn't even really describe how their samples were collected, or I mean, how they were recruited, so you kind of really had no sense of who are these people you know, that gave us these data. So I think just being uh, you know, clear even about you know, the descriptive information that we provide on samples would be one place to start, uh, too. But Steve, you had. Um, and so saying I think some easy s solutions just to incentivize this that, um, I think that we could consider awards um, badges, um, these kinds of ideas that wouldn't be hard to do, wouldn't cost much money, and they're just the subtle cues to, to signal to everyone, signal to granting agencies and, and um, to our uh, promotion committees that these are valued, and I'm sure we'll act in accordance with those incentives. One other thing, too, is I think that, you know, I think that people also that are just people, authors submitting their articles to journals do have some power in terms of uh, communicating to editors what they think should be valued at these journals. And so I think, um, you know, sometimes editors need that, to hear that feedback, need to, sometimes they need to show that feedback to the publications committees that are kind of overseeing some of their decisions about what it is that the authors who are submitting there actually value in, in research. And so uh, if there are things that they need to do differently, communicate that to the journals that you are think are ones that you want to uh, submit to. And sometimes that information uh, can actually lead to change. I know also so at JRP, when I was, I'm no longer editor at JRP after many, many years, um, but uh, uh, while we were there at the end, what we tried to do is also do, did a lot of tracking of these sorts of things so we can present that information to people. And we also did it comparing our, our journal to other journals, which uh, if we eventually report some of what we find, you know, maybe we can look at comparisons of journals in terms of the participants that they use. Um, and see, and one of the things we were interested in is as we increase sample size at JRP, did that make push people more towards using mTORC and undergraduate samples? And it didn't. Our sample sizes went way up. There were no increases in, in uh, mm -hmm. the use of mTORC and um, uh, undergraduate samples overall. Um, and I think part of it is because we did uh, end up using a lot of people that submit their use existing data sets that are large and, and uh, more diverse than that in the first place. Um, but you know, having those uh, meta 
uh, scientific data on what journals are doing so that we can evaluate them, compare them, and then put pressure on ones that maybe are not doing the things that you as a community value uh, can, cr can push uh, people in the right direction, I think. May I add one more thought? Uh, this is following up Steve's um, uh, uh, idea of, of using the awards mechanism. And I, I think our awards tend to be given uh, to individual researchers. Uh, but I think there may be ways in which we can use that mechanism to really encourage, um, for example, collaborations. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there's an award for the most mm -hmm. innovative ways of uh, collaboration. Um, uh, or uh, uh, maybe um, there could be an award for um, uh, 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 important insight about human behavior that emerged from uh, um, multiple teams of uh, researchers working together. Um, Nobel Prizes are given sometimes to multiple researchers who uh, came to, uh, made uh, in, uh, independent discoveries and so on, but I'm just imagining something larger. Uh, so here's a new insight that came from the work of 100 different people working in collaboration in five different uh, uh, groups and so on. And uh, of course, we have an uh, issue of how do you select a person to get up on stage to receive the award. Uh, but I, I think that there may be some mechanisms to encourage uh, these new kinds of uh, moving forward you know, as a science. Yeah, we probably have time for one more question, I would say. And looking down here, I feel that um, many of the top questions are variations on the themes that we've been discussing about changing the incentive structure. But um, here's one that's different, I think. So um, I'll ask it. <laughs> it's a little bit different direction. So what are some recommended recruitment strategies that would enable a sample to be more authentically representative? <laughs> okay, you stumped. The <laughs> Expanding the, the diversity of researchers. Uh, I, think that I, I would imagine that would help. Well, yes. I know other disciplines do have methods to get a representative sample, a representative sample of the country, and there are some databases, I think like YouGov, that will help you get a, a representative sample uh, of that country. And that can also just be applied more internationally, other countries to get representative samples from there too. Yeah, I, I don't know if the person that asked this question had in mind like technically representative samples or just you know, I'm not quite sure what they meant by authentically representative, but I'm, I'm not sure they mean random, uh, random samples. So I don't know if you have any other thoughts about, uh, you know, s samples that are, I mean, there are different kinds of, of um, representational strategies besides random sampling. So I don't know if you have any. Yeah, well, this reminds me of an issue that oftentimes comes up during cross-cultural work, which is you might collect data in, an, in another country or culture or region, uh, but that sample is another convenient sample that is also highly educated. So two, you know, a highly educated sample from Turkey and a highly educated sample from the United States are going to be more similar to each other mm -hmm. than a highly educated sample from the United States and perhaps a, you know, lower. Uh, working class sample from the South or from the United States. So uh, maybe that's what that person had in mind, like authentic meaning like truly, you know, it's, it makes sense to ma engage in that comparison or to study that group perhaps. And I think too, if you are wanting to make a bold claim of universality uh, of your phenomena, of course you're not gonna be able to study all the different samples of the world. But one sort of shortcut strategy, I, I think back to uh, Paul Ekman looking at emotional expressions. And so his strategy was, well, where would we be the least likely to find evidence of this if this wasn't universal? And he came up with the foray in New Guinea. And so I think that's one thing, we don't have to go to New Guinea, but I think that um, coming up with from what we know about other cultures, what might we predict a place that would be less likely or the least likely to, um, to be able to replicate our findings and try testing it there. And if you do find evidence there, that's pretty convincing evidence, at least a first step towards that uh, universality evidence. Well, Can I, I, oh. I'm, is it short? Because I'm uh, conscious of the time, and uh, three, we're three actually sentences. one minute over. Okay, okay. okay we're going to uh, end so, with Yuichi's <laughs> comment then. So, so uh, trying to get a representative sample in the sense of numerical proportional representative sample um, may or may not be um, 
the, the, the panacea in the sense that if you get a representative sample of the United States, probably the uh, proportion of Native Americans in that uh, sample will be very small. And uh, as a result, you might get um, results that you uh, would attribute to the, quote, average American, uh, but the smaller minorities uh, in, a, in a representative sample would not be reflected in there. So I think that we need to think deeply about the notion of representativeness mm -hmm. beyond just proportional representation. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me today.